Welcome to Behind the Music, stories of the band from McLean Church. You often see them singing on stage, playing an instrument or two, and leading us in worship, both in person and online. It's a passion and a calling. They love what they do, and we love how they share their talents with us. But we don't often hear from them or know too much about them. So we decided to go behind the music and bring you their stories. Scott, we are uh, glad to have the opportunity to have you here with us today. Thanks for, uh, thanks for sitting down with us. Hey, thanks for having me here, Ben. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, Scott, m so many of us have seen you on stage and online playing guitar at McLean Church. But what we'd like to know is a little more of who you are and how you came to be a part of what McLean is doing these days. So, so if you can, give us a little background. Tell us where you're from. Uh, tell us about your family and maybe even where you work here in the Erie area. Okay, well, actually, I was born in Cleveland, moved to Erie when I was around 11 years old. Um, started my first band about a year later. Um, so went to school in Erie, graduated from uh, Strong Vincent High School. Uh, later went to college, uh, got a degree in psychology, did some master's work in counseling. Um, later on through my career, um, I got interested in technology, and so I went back to school uh, years later and got a, uh, uh, a degree in information uh, systems uh, design and development. And actually, I've been working in that area for over two decades at St. Vincent. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And you're married? Uh, yes, my, my wife, Pam. Um, we have an older daughter who's uh, married and uh, lives in Canada with her family and uh, two children. She has a, I have a grandson who's 19 and um, a granddaughter who just turned 10. Uh, Pam and I have a son and daughter who live, uh, well, uh, had lived in Erie most of their lives. My daughter is a nurse and recently moved down to Pittsburgh. And my son uh, works for a, a large company here in Erie as a construction manager, so. All right, all right. So um, when did you get into music? Where did that come from? And, so, and as you think about that, music's pretty broad. Why the guitar? Well, that's, that, that's real interesting. And I'm going to show my age here. So um, actually, I got into playing guitar prior to the whole Beatles and British invasion. So when I was pretty young, there was a TV show, Ozzie and Harriet, Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet Nelson. And at the end of every show, Ricky Nelson would come out with his band and do a song. And I thought, that's really cool. So uh, I was living in Cleveland, and when I had an opportunity to take some music lessons, I decided to play the guitar. So that, that's kind of how it all started. And then, of course, years later, um, you know, when we had all the bands coming from England and uh, the Beatles. By that time, I was in Erie and got together with folks and you know, started our little junior high bands and that type of thing. So when was that timeline that far? How old were you when you oh, started? Oh, so actually, started, I was, yeah. actually, I was eight years old when I first started taking guitar lessons. I was in third grade. Wow, wow. <laughs> and uh, was that, so was that, you know, once a week, since eight years old? Was it a formal lesson? Yeah, informal? right. Well, so it was at, at a uh, local music school, kind of learning the rudiments. Things were so much different back then. We didn't have YouTube. There wasn't the style of playing there. It was very rudimentary, you know, learning the notes on the guitar, learning the chords. You know, I, I jokingly said, I, I think it was six months before they let me play a chord, you know, and, you know, and now, you know, kids are far more advanced because there's a lot of things out there of different ways that they can learn. Uh, so I can't really continue that on a little bit 
um, when I moved to Erie, they only started playing with bands. You would just start learning songs on the radio, records, cassettes, whatever. You started really teaching yourself at that point how to play that kind of music. Right, right. So then junior high, you started your first band, is that right? Right, uh, started our first band. We play like, you know, some little parties and things like that, some dances. Um, probably one of the, uh, when I was in junior high and then later on high school, one of the big things was the schools used to have a big variety show. And you get a chance to have your band play there. And that was kind of the exposure where like, you know, everybody in the community or at the school really got to see you play. And that's where people say, wow, you know, that's pretty cool. You guys, are, you guys are pretty good or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it started at eight. You've, you started your first band in junior high and yeah. you've just been rolling since then, huh? Yeah, it seems like <laughs> <laughs> the train just keeps rolling. Yeah. Well, I, I think anybody who's seen you play uh, would say you're really talented and um, you are you are a true musician. You don't just go up there and and hammer on the guitar. You are a musician. You care about the notes. You care about the chords. I've seen you behind the scenes in rehearsals, making sure that everything's lining up. Where did all that come from? Because I don't know that everybody's like that, but you take a special care to well, what you do. I think it's just from being in bands and having to work with different people at different levels for many, many years. I have found that uh, working with uh, at various churches and working in, uh, with bands in the praise and worship, there's some of those folks, that's all they've ever done. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but they really didn't you know, hone their skills out on the stage, you know, playing four hour gigs and playing 40 songs a night. You know, they come and they play three or four songs. Uh, it's a lot different. So when you've done that, you just have a chance to really learn how to work as a band and try to hone your skills. And, you know, and I appreciate the compliment, you know, um, like most people, they'll say, well, you know, there's a lot of people who are much better than myself. I mean, I see people here in town who I look up to, who I think are very good. Um, but you have to know your limitations, know what you can do. And I think I've learned to work within that. I know the context which I can work. You know, I'm not a classical guitar player. I'm not a jazz guitar player. I'm basically a rock and roll guitar player. Yeah. You know, that's what I know. So that's, that's how I play. And I have, I hear the, the what the sound, how I want it, my guitar to sound in my head and how I want the band to sound. And sometimes I get a little bit, you know, OCD about, you know, how things are supposed to be uh, working on the way a part's supposed to sound uh, because I want that, I, I want to have a, you know, if you excuse the term, a good product, you know, whether it's in a commercial band or in church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a lot of time that goes into that ahead of time, but you also mentioned just now in passing, like being on stage for three or four hours playing 40 songs, what's that experience like? Well, you know, it's, it, it, it can have its ups and downs. I mean, you can be in a scenario where you're basically background music at a restaurant, you know, in a duo mm -hmm. or something, or playing in a band in front of 3,000 people down at a pavilion on the bayfront. Um, or at a uh, celebrate area or a block party or something like that, or in a, or a noisy bar. Right, I mean, right. it's, it, it goes the whole gambit. Um, but really what it comes down to, you have to enjoy what you're doing, and, and it really comes down to the people you're working with, you know, the relationship you have with the band. And that's really, I think, what makes music special is when the musicians are playing off each other and they kind of understand what each other is doing and you're listening to each other um, and you know what everybody else is doing and you try to fit in instead of like just, I'm just out there just playing for myself. Right. You're really part of a team and, and, and that's just as important or maybe even more important when you're doing, um, you know, playing here at church. You're very well prepared when you come to play. Tell us, what, what does your preparation look like? What, how much time do you spend practicing? And, and for you, 
what does practice look like? So for sure. us, we see you on stage, but I wonder how much practice do you do? And, you know, is it, is it mental? Is it, is it how many hours are you at home, you know, driving your wife nuts? playing? The <laughs> oh, same, yeah. <laughs> you know, so what does, what does practice look like and, and how much do you practice right. before you come to a, a show? So we're fortunate to use a, a program called Planning Center. So all the songs are posted on there. So we usually know, hopefully, well ahead of time. Sometimes things change days before. Keys change, and so you have to be prepared and keep an eye on that. So in my home office, I have a setup with the, basically the, um, the pedal board, as it were, um, that I use at church. And I would first go and listen through the songs and, and try to understand, you know, well, where the guitar parts are, where those fit in. Um, and I will actually spend a lot of time programming my uh, sound processor, my Helix board, to, to uh, have the sounds that I want to use for a particular song. And then I'll work on learning those parts. Um, sometimes it's in a different key than I did it, you know, the previous month or whatever. So you have to learn how, you know, how you're going to play that on the guitar in a different key, um, which is always sometimes interesting. Uh, and sometimes the keys change when you, <laughs> five minutes before you go on stage. Um, so, you know, depending upon if it's a song I'm familiar with, you know, I may just be, oh, I just need to run through this again and relearn the parts, maybe take some notes on my iPad so I remember the part that I'm doing. Um, it may be learning a whole new song, listen to it several times. Um, often I'll go, you know, if there's a studio version, you know, on YouTube, then I'll look up to see the live version of the band, you know, maybe Bethel or Hillsong, who are, how they're playing it and, you know, how they're performing that and what things I can kind of pick up from that. So, you know, sometimes it can, you know, it can be several hours within a week just preparing for those few songs. Yeah, and that's just at home practice. And yes. then you come to the rehearsal prior to the right. the, the worship uh, uh, service and then the worship service itself. Right. So. All told, you're looking at, what, right. 10 hours a week? Oh, well, yeah, it can be, you know, we always say, you know, practice is what you do at home, rehearsal is what you do here. Mm. And, um, you know, hopefully everybody comes prepared and that's, and th and that's a big part of it. And that helps, helps a lot. Um, you know, we look at like when I played uh, in Edinburgh uh, on Easter, uh, we actually got together the Saturday before for a few hours, went over the songs. Then we had to get there early on Sunday, I think 6.30, to go over songs again and then play three services. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. That was a long weekend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was very gratifying, I think. Yeah. Gratifying in a lot of different ways. I would think one way is that we came off a year of 2020 where you didn't pr probably didn't get to play a lot, yeah. uh, whether it was outside venues or church worship services. and. And you have a strong social media presence uh, in, in, for a lot of the different bands that you're in. How hard was it to go from, you know, sharing all the locations and spots that you're going to be playing on social media to the worship services in, in 2020, not having anything? really or or very very limited how hard was 2020 for you not being able to play in venues and how did how did that summer change yeah it really changed a lot it seems like i was doing more posting about canceled gigs mm -hmm. <laughs> than what we were playing in fact i had one band basically just break up all together uh, because everything that we had was canceled uh, you know as a comparison um, you know i was fortunate um, because I was able to pick up things by playing actually in three different bands and two duos last year. So I did probably 20 gigs all told. Well, by comparison, the prior year I did almost four times as many. Yeah. So, you know, it was a, a big change. Uh, uh, some venues completely closed or stopped music altogether. Uh, I, again, I'm blessed that I have a full-time job. I wasn't depending upon that for my income. Uh, where you know, I know folks in town who you know, get most of their income from playing or teaching, and that changed a lot for them. Uh, but you know, it was probably more frustrating at, 
than anything. And it's like, well, when is this going to come back? Because we kept thinking, oh, it's going to come back next month. It's going to come back in the summer. And then all of a sudden, your summer gigs got canceled. And then, you know, um, you didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, things are just starting to kind of come back a little bit now. Um, you know, the winter was tough because obviously we couldn't play outside. Um, and so at least in the summer, there's with some venues, we were able to do some uh, larger outdoor venues last summer, um, which kind of filled in some of the space. But uh, 2021, good to be back, right? Oh, Things yeah, Things are definitely. starting to open up definitely, a little more. Definitely, definitely. I, I don't think it's going to be like 2019. I don't think it's going to take a while before you get back to that. Um, some of the venues are just starting to open back up. Some of them have indicated they're not going to open back up again. Um, and we'll see. I think it's harder, particularly for, you know, larger bands, uh, particularly in indoors. You know, we're hoping we have good weather and we can do some things outside. So, you know. We'll see. Huh? Yeah, we'll see, that's for sure. Yeah. have a pick in your pocket. The guy had played at the um, Church of the Bar once with the Flight Path Band and actually um, at some point I played at the Borough, a friend of mine was playing there and we uh, I went there and played a weekend. Yeah. So uh, I told Joel, I said, oh, well tell Paul if he ever needs a guitar player give me a call. Yeah. He called me that week. <laughs> Seven and a half years later, yeah, I'm still exactly. here. What, what not to say to a worshiper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Give me a call. call. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a call. Yeah. You know, and there was probably, um, you know, prior to the pandemic, you know, prior to you, yeah. um, there was probably a good, you know, three years at least that uh, it was just uh, me and Paul, Dan on drums, uh, Steve Schallenberger. Mm -hmm. So, Scott, you've been, you've been talking about uh, different bands that you were in. Uh, how many bands have you been in over the years? What, what would you say? Oh boy. Well, I haven't really sat down and counted, but probably if you would look at all the bands I've played with, whether that was ones I was in for several years or just filled in for one night, it's probably a couple dozen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in all the bands that you've been a part of, uh, have you ever opened for any big acts? Like, did you get on big stages or were they mostly just like cocktail bars or things like that? I know, well, you know, in different scenarios, I mean, even going back to high school, um, um, one of my high school bands opened in Edinburgh for a, a national touring uh, act, Blues Image, that had a, uh, had a big hit, uh, Ride Captain Ride, um, if anybody remembers that. So that was probably the first bigger show that we did. Uh, but going on to when um, uh, I was touring with my band Clockwise, you know, we were traveling around the country opening for a lot of the more popular contemporary Christian acts at that point, like Randy Stonehill, Fireworks, uh, The Resurrection or Res Band, DeGarmo and Key. Um, and then back in Erie years later, uh, we did some things down at the uh, amphitheater on the Bayfront where we'd play for like 3,000 people. And we opened up for um, a band with um, members of uh, Jimmy Buffett's Coral Reefers. So uh, a lot of different things. Yeah. Now, if I recall, you uh, was a couple years ago, you went up to Toronto and played at the Sky Dome? Right, right. So... Um, there was a thing that was called uh, Margaritaville in, at the uh, MLB, something of that nature. And um, some folks that I had played with down here were in contact with a, a fellow up in Toronto and had to put together a, a band to go play up there. And we actually uh, played before a Blue Jays game. And that was, that was pretty awesome, overlooking that field. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's quite a different experience. A lot of fun. So you, you mentioned touring across the country. How far did you go? Well, 
that's an you know, interesting question. Um, I remember um, you were asking Terry, did he ever have any thoughts of making it big or doing anything like that? I mean, I think he only had one uh, illusion or delusion of doing that when I was in probably college, and we packed up the band and drove to L.A. <laughs> and basically uh, slept on the beach <laughs> because we didn't have any money, and we played a few places on the Sunset Strip um, and actually were on the same stage as this um, little cover band that was playing there at the time. You might have heard of them. They're called Van Halen. But back then, they were just a cover band. They hadn't hit yet or anything. They're, we went and saw them, and they were just playing covers. And years later, well, we know what happened there. Yeah. So you were on the same stage that Van Halen was on the same stage. <laughs> Both cover bands, yep. do, both just trying <laughs> yeah. to play, right? Right. One hits it big. Yeah, and right. One lands back in Erie, PA. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Did you ever, you ever uh, make peace with that one? Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, there's, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a funny business. It's just kind of like sports. You know, there's many talented people out there. There's many talented musicians um, who just never make it. You know, may get a contract and have one record. And then, you know, the career falls apart. Um, it really is a, a lot of luck. I mean, the way the business is, particularly today, it's very difficult for, you know, uh, even people who are very, very talented to really kind of make it and break out on a national level. So I've been very happy with my music career. So, Scott, describe what it's like playing on a weeknight at a local establishment. Uh, with a common crowd in front of you, and how much fun you have playing locally here in Erie. Yeah, I mean, it really is, um, you know, enjoyable experience for the, for the most part. You know, uh, a lot of us musicians like to say they we get paid for moving equipment and we play for free, uh, because particularly if you're in a large band and you're carrying all your own equipment and lights, you could be there setting up for three hours and then you know, playing for another three hours and then breaking down. <laughs> so uh, there's that part of it, which a lot of people don't think about. They just see, oh, it's all the fun time, you're up on stage and you know, uh, and, and that is enjoyable, particularly when things are clicking with the other, other musicians and you can take that energy and pour it off the stage or platform to your audience um, and that they're really enjoying it and uh, you have to, you know, they're, they're kind of, as we would say, getting into it. So, you know, that's always fun when, when people are really, you know, they're singing along and they, you know, they come up and they ask for songs. You know, it's, it's kind of funny, particularly, it's, it's a lot easier with my duo where uh, my singer will say, she goes, oh, if you want to hear anything, let us know. And I'm thinking, oh boy, here we go. And uh, then somebody will come up and ask us to do a song and we're pulling it up on our iPads. You know, we've never played it before, you know. And uh, so you always hope you're going to get a good tip for that one. <laughs> there you go. Well, we are, we're so thankful for what you bring to McLean. Uh, how did you get connected to playing in churches? Well, we, we, we kind of talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, and I really hadn't thought about this for a while, but it probably even goes back to when I was a teenager. Um, I played at some what was called folk masses back then. Uh, at a couple of local Catholic churches. And that was probably the first time that anything kind of contemporary was in the church, and particularly guitars. And I, had, I did that for a while. Um, so the way I got started playing in churches with the, with the band and the electric, electric guitar, uh, I went to a, see a Christian band um, playing in town by the name of Jonah. And uh, one of the members of the band was Angelo Natale, who was Joel's older brother. And I got talking to him, and he told me about the church that they were going to. They actually were meeting in the basement of a Methodist church here in town. And I think I gave him my number, and he called me some weeks later and said, hey, you know, why don't you come to church sometime? And so I actually ended up going on a, a Good Friday, and it was a very moving um, experience for me. I ended up staying there and uh, ultimately ended up playing uh, for the church services. And then sometime later, they asked me, asked me to uh, join the band. And at that time, they were just finishing up uh, an album. 
um, and they had changed the name of the band to Clockwise. And so I, that's when I joined that band, and we started touring around Canada and the U.S., um, uh, doing a lot of openings for um, some of the more popular um, uh, musicians in, you know, what we call like kind of the Jesus movement, the Jesus music that was really kind of taking off at that time. Um, and then actually um, Joel's older brother, Pete Natale, started booking us at colleges um, at secular venues. And uh, one particular one I remember was opening up for a band called Black Oak, Arkansas, who was fairly popular at the time. So that was a whole different thing, bringing this Christian music into that secular world. So what's it like playing at McLean? Uh, you've played all around, you've played um, in, in local establishments. What's it like playing with the McLean band on the weekend? Well, you know, it's, it is a different experience. Um, when I first came to McLean, which is almost seven and a half years ago, uh, kind of wandered into uh, McLean Erie when they were over at the little uh, white church on West Gore Road. Um, and I was talking to uh, Joel and Tally, and I had, um, I knew Paul McCosco, because uh, actually um, one of my church bands had played at the church in the bar one time. And so offhand, I said to Joel, I said, hey, uh, tell Paul if he ever needs a guitar player to give me a call sometime. Well, he called me that week, and seven and a half years later, I'm still here. Um, so there probably was a time that, um, uh, between Paul and Steve Schalmer, myself and a drummer, we played you know, every Sunday for three or four years, whether it was at the West Gore and the, the Golf Dome and later here at the Erie site. Of course, the pandemic changed everything. You know, up to that point, I really hadn't played much at the, um, the Edinburgh site. So then things started going more online. And so you know, every couple of weeks, we were recording for the online service. And when things started opening up, I started playing more at the Edinburgh site. So there's still, you know, there's all the preparation. You still have to get here, set up everything. There's a lot of technology behind the scenes that people don't see. We're using all inner monitors to hear each other. Um, we're working out songs, um, you know, making sure that we have everything, you know, organized and put together. Um, but, it, but it's... Uh, it's, there's still that same uh, camaraderie, you know, working with musicians, meeting different people, uh, and really kind of enjoying each other as musicians. But there's also that whole spiritual side that we get to pray together, pray for each other, and kind of support each other in those ways too. Yeah, you, you mentioned growing up playing at church from an early age in different styles and venues of churches. How, how has music grown your own faith in Christ? Well, I think, I mean, music has had such a connection for me, in, I guess, in every facet of my life for so many years. And it's really how I first connected with the church and with Christ, of hearing the word through music. You know, not necessarily somebody hitting me over the head with a Bible or something, but hearing um, a Christian band, you know, really promoting and talking about Jesus and talking about the gospel through music and hearing it that way. Um, I mean, it, it strikes, you know, different people um, relate to things in a different way, but that just really struck a chord with me, you know, in my heart, in my emotions, in my spirit. And so there's always been that component of it. It's not just the music, you know, it's the lyrics, it's a story, it's, it's how the story is told, how the gospel is told through, you know, a personal story or through um, a song that's, you know, quoting scripture. Well, Scott, you play with a ton of energy, a ton of passion. Where does that come from? You're moving all over the stage and I love it, but where does that come from? I don't know. I, I guess it's just 
from my rock roots of, you know, where I always feel the music. And if you feel it, you know, physically your body, it kind of reacts to that. And um, particularly, you know, playing in church, I feel that's, you know, even part of the way I worship, you know, not only through my playing, but through just uh, the, the physical side of it. You know, I want to get people involved. I mean, here in Erie, sometimes you'll see me, you know, I'll stop playing and I'll start, you know, trying to get people to clap their hands and kind of get, get some energy going. Because um, I think that's an important part of it. I want people to, to kind of feel that what I'm feeling. You talked a lot about playing with uh, with bands, the camaraderie, meeting a bunch of different people. If if, if you put your um, marketing hat on or or advertising hat on, why should someone pick up an instrument and join the McLean team? Well, that's a good that's a good question. I mean, there's a time when you know there's been different articles over the past few years saying, well, you know, is uh, is the guitar dead? You know, uh, there's so much electronic music these days. You know, people can go in and program these things. Um, I think the pandemic has actually helped promote instruments because people have been home and actually guitar sales have gone up. Um, actually, I bought a few myself, but, <laughs> but trying to help the economy. So um, I, I think it's the idea of um, not only learning the music, but being able to be part of something bigger, bigger than yourself. And McLean has an interesting, uh, I think, philosophy with that. You might say, oh, well, you know, you know, there's somebody with, you know, 20 years of experience, or, you know, it's, there's somebody who's really good on drums, or, you know, they're a really good singer. You know, I could never be up there. Um, but I've seen younger people come through the ranks who are just learning. And you know they're just working on those skills, and um, you know Spence is really good about really working with those people one on one, whether it's a vocalist or a guitar player or a bass player or somebody, really helping them and putting them with people who are more experienced to really kind of learn the ropes and work with those folks. And I try to keep my eyes out for that. If I see somebody you know struggling a little bit, you know I'll try to without being too heavy-handed, you know. Um, you know, say, you know, you know, maybe, you know, try doing this or, you know, this is what this means when you see these notes on the page, you know, this is a transition or, you know, this is, you know, how this is, um, you know, you know, this is how maybe, you know, you could better play this or that type of thing. But I think it's, it's very rewarding, you know, if you're just beginning and you have some interest, you know, give it a try and, um, you know, and, and see how that works out. Awesome. Thanks for your time, Scott. Very good.